This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Be seated. Our scriptural text today comes from Psalm 126, verse 1 through 6 in the modern English version of the scriptures. You'll notice there are these words. When the Lord restored the captives of Zion, we were like those who dream. I want you to know that God's getting ready to do something if you've been walking upright, if you've been faithful, if you've been faithful during a difficult season. God says, I'm going to bring you out and restore you in such a way that you're going to feel like you're dreaming. It's going to be like those who dream. Your nightmare is getting ready to come to an end. And then our mouth was filled with laughter. Oh, you've been crying, but God's getting ready to change the sound that's coming out of your mouth. My God, I feel something in this place today. My God is getting ready to break some things off of you. He's getting ready to shift the season of your life. Yes, that's been crying and weeping, but your mouth is getting ready to be filled with the sound of laughter. Laughter is the sound of victory that says, devil, it doesn't matter what you're trying to do to try to break my spirit. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I declare to you in the name. Yes. <laughs> Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. And they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Somebody is getting ready to say your testimony for you. They're getting ready to declare that I saw them when they're down, but the Lord has restored them. The Lord has blessed them. The Lord has healed them. The Lord has delivered them. The Lord has set them free. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Then he says, restore our captives, O Lord, as the streams in the Negev, those who sow in tears, those who sow in tears, those who sow in tears, it's been a weeping season, but you're getting ready to come into a season of day, glory, a season of joy, joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory. He goes forth, he who goes forth and weeps, bearing precious seed to sow, shall come home again with rejoicing. God says you are not going to come back the same way you went. You won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. Bound, oppressed, tormented, sick or lame. For the Holy Ghost of Acts is still the same. And you won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. You might have come forth with weeping, but you will bear precious seed to sow. Shall come home again with rejoicing, bringing his grain sheaves with him. And I'm speaking today from the subject, the blessing of persistence the blessing of persistence. Anytime that you are going to pursue a lofty goal, endeavor, pursuit, you are going to be tempted to quit. I don't know a person who has accomplished something that has been great that was not tempted to stop because you always experience defeat before you experience final victory. And you cannot stop in a down season. It, it's, it's crazy. You know, remember that the way that God deals with us, uh, God blesses us and then he breaks us. And then he gives us. You're not even ready to be given until you've first been broken. And you're not ready to be broken until you have first been blessed. He blessed them first and then broke them. And what, what, a, what a contradiction that feels as though it is when I'm blessed but I'm broken. But the reason that God blesses us and then breaks us is to get out of us what he's put in us. 
How else do you get the blessing out of the person if you never break them? He blessed Abraham and then he broke him and then he gave him. He blessed Moses and then he broke him in the desert and then he gave him as the greater del deliverer that Israel ever knew. He blessed Jesus, then he broke him in the wilderness temp temptation, then he gave him as the savior of the world. It's the process of God that he blesses us and then breaks you. You ought to know that if you are broken, you're already blessed first. And how dare you allow your brokenness to make you feel unblessed. It is the evidence that you have been blessed. And because of that, it is saying that because I've been blessed, even in my brokenness, I'll live through this. It is a way of saying that this too shall pass. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. God is prophetically letting us know that he is the only one who's able to bring joy out of sorrow. He is the only one who's able to bring laughter out of tears. He is the only one who is able to bring good out of evil. God is the one who does that. And so when I read this passage here, the first thing that jumps out to me is that God is a God of restoration. God is a restorer, my friend. I know you might have lost some things. You might have been broken and hurt and depressed, but God is a restorer. Just hold your hope. Hold your hope. God is a restorer. God is a restorer. And remember, he's not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. I mean, whatever God has said, he's going to make it good. Just, just hang on, just hang on, because God is faithful to his word. Not one jot or one tittle of this word is going to pass away until all of it has been fulfilled. God said, just hold on, just hold, hold my word. If you hold my word, my word will hold you. Just, just hold it, just hold it, just hold it. And so I want you to see here, what this speaks to me is that faithfulness in seasons of sorrow is followed by fruitfulness in seasons of harvest. If you'll just be faithful in a season of sorrow, it'll be followed by fruitfulness in seasons of harvest. That's all that he's saying, they that sow in tears in a season of sorrow shall reap in joy. Your faithfulness to sow when you're sad, when the times are, are, are hard, to still be faithful. Anybody can be faithful in good times when the money is still flowing. But if somebody will stand by you and be faithful with you while you're struggling, while the car is broken down on the side of the road, everybody wants to ride with you in the limo. But when you're broken, if they'll stay with you, so how you try to get your car fixed and somebody that told you to a shop, that, that's, that's your ride or die chick, brother. That's your knight in shining armor, sister. If they will stand with you when everything is broken, you better hang on to that. Because faithfulness in seasons of sorrow lead to fruitfulness in seasons of harvest. And if you focus on the hurt, you'll keep on suffering. But if you focus on the lesson and focus on the blessing, you'll keep on growing. Whenever you get in a situation that is uncomfortable, in a setback, in a disappointment, in brokenness, start looking for the lesson. Start looking for the lesson and start looking for the blessing. There's a lesson and a blessing in every negative situation. There is a lesson and a blessing. The lesson is don't do this again. Uh, Sometimes the lesson is don't do it with them again. <laughs> you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. Get the lesson. Get the lesson. Get the lesson. It is a fool who keeps on doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result every time. Get the lesson. Get the lesson and find the blessing. There's a blessing in every negative situation. There's a blessing. Don't leave out of a negative situation without the lesson and the blessing. Don't leave without either one. You need to be able to find a purpose in the midst of your suffering. Find a purpose. Because if you know that this is just for a season, it gives you staying power. 
If you feel like this will never come to anything, you, you, may, you may as well cut your losses now. But if I believe that if I keep on sowing, because certain things, just like an apple seed, you plant an apple seed, it takes two years before that apple tree will produce the first apple. Two years. And if you're looking for an apple in three months, you're going to be deeply disappointed. It takes time. It takes time. They that sow in tears. Have you ever been working on something in your life and you had to cry on your way to work? cry on your way to school, still going, still being faithful, still saying, Lord, you know, I, I don't even like these folks that I work with, but I'm going, I mean, I got some bills to pay and I got some things that I'm dealing with. I'm not going in here because I'm in love with everybody. I'm not even in love with this job, but you know, it's, it's the right now thing that's helping me to keep my lights on and my cell phone bill paid. So I'm still going, my Lord, why well, I got to keep on because so and so done been blasted. So-and-so got a husband, so-and-so got a wife, and Lord, and I'm Jesus, and I'm still on the bus, and so-and-so got a new car. You got to keep on sowing seeds of faithfulness because they that sow in tears while they're crying going to work, while they're crying and complaining about this and that, sowing, but faithfully, faithful, 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 to say, you know, I don't feel like going today, but I got mouths to feed. I got somebody who's dependent on me. I don't, I'm not going here because I want to go today or I feel like going today. I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm in sorrow right now, but I'm doing this because I got to do this until I can do that. You have to do what you've got to do until you can do what you want to do. And if you'll do what others won't do, you can have what others can't have. But you got to sow faithfully, faithfully while you're crying while you're out there in practice over and over and over, while you're studying, while you're up searching things, while you're up trying to figure things out. It's a, it's a terrible season. It doesn't feel good because it's a scary season because you're trying to work this thing out. How do I figure, what am I going to do, Lord? And you're searching and racking your brain and saying, God, how, 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 how can I make this work for me? Because the last thing now has, has petered up, the last brook that I was in has dried up and I'm trying to find my next place of feeding and I'm crying all the time but I'm I've got a resolve that I I got to make it happen I can't stop I got to keep searching I got to keep looking and that's where we are that those that sow in tears shall reap in joy it's not in vain it's not in vain it's not in vain but you got to find a purpose in it find a purpose in it because purpose fuels persistence purpose fuels Persistent. If you understand my purpose, that while I'm still changing diapers, that while I'm still buying formula, I know one day this child is going to bring joy to me. They crying and I'm crying. But one day, I just couldn't wait. I couldn't wait for my children to get out of diapers. I just couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to, to not have to put them in a car seat and get a baby bag. And then, you know, you got grandmothers telling you, you know, you enjoy these babies while they're young because they grow up so fast. It doesn't seem like they grow up so fast <laughs> when you're still changing diapers and cleaning spit up off of your clothes. And it, it's what you discover is that the days are long, but the years are short. That's what they were saying is that you're going to look back and say, oh, my God. And you don't really recognize it until you haven't seen a child for a few weeks or a few months. And then you see the growth. And then you begin to understand the days are long. They seem long to you in the day. But when you look back, the years are very short. And that's the thing. But purpose fuels persistence. This is not in vain. I'm working in some, on something. I'm investing in something. I'm laying a foundation in something and something great is going to come out of this. The very, the very first question that Jesus posed is recorded in scripture in St. John chapter 1 in verse 38. And he simply asked this question, what do you seek? Suppose Jesus asked you that today, what do you seek? In other words, other translations put it this way, what do you want? What all are you looking for? What are you looking for? What do you seek? What do you seek? It's the first question that Jesus asked in Scripture. 
And he didn't do a whole lot of question asking, but that was the very first one. What do you seek? And that's foundational. What, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Because if, if you don't know what you're looking for, you won't recognize it when you see it. And he's asking, what, what are you looking for? And that's why you've got to be able to find the purpose. It's like, what are you, what, for what purpose? For what purpose are you living? Please understand you didn't come into this world just to go to school and then get a job and work all of your life and then die. Life is so much bigger than that. If you're going to have a full life, it's, it's so much bigger than that. And so deciding what you want and then pursuing that is, is half, half the battle. And it takes persistence in order to get it because these things are not within reach. So you have to do something every day. It is persistence that builds habits. And habits begin to shape and form your life. Persistence. Persistence. And some people might say, you know, my spouse is very persistent. And they may be persistent, but some of them are actually stubborn because they're not the same. And if you don't know the difference between persistence and stubbornness, you'll confuse them. Here's what stubbornness is. Stubbornness is the dogged determination not to change one's attitude or position on something. Now, if you live with somebody like that, just keep looking straight ahead. <laughs> Stubbornness is the dogged determination not to change one's attitude or position on something. They can be totally wrong, and you can be bringing facts and proving something to them. They say, I still don't care. I don't care what they say. They're going to believe what they want to believe. They will not change their attitude nor their position on it. That's stubbornness. That's stubbornness. Here's persistence. Persistence is the ability to pivot to change, to learn from failures, to try a new approach, and then to grow stronger with each setback. You ever notice if, if you've ever gone into uh, uh, something like uh, escape the room, and you'll come to something and it's a dead end here, you, you don't just give up and then just lay down on the floor and start crying and say, hey, can come and rescue me, come and get, come and get me. No, 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 you, you, you turn around, you, you go down and, and, and find another thing. Life is a maze like that. It's amazing. So a persistent person doesn't say, oh, no, I can't do it. I mean, a persistent person does not say, well, I don't have the money to be able to hire a chef to come in here, but you need dinner. The persistent person said, get your behind up. <laughs> Grow some stuff in your own backyard. Said, so you got to learn how to be able, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. You don't know how creative that you can be until you're operating on a shoestring budget. Who am I talking to in this place? Maybe God wanted to show you how you can take a little bit and feed a whole family. I have so much respect for people that's able to take a little rice and beans and make some cornbread and know how to be able to spread this thing out and, and you have a big glass of water and you know, feed, fill yourself up on it, but you can make a meal and stretch it and, and you can ask God to bless it. It's amazing, it is amazing how you can raise children off a little of nothing because you were persistent. Persistence didn't say, I don't have enough and so I throw, up the, I throw my hands in, I throw it in the towel. No, no, no. Persistence said, I got to find a way. I, I got to pivot. I got to turn here. I'm going to find a way my children are going to eat. My children are going to eat. My children are going to eat. I started to bring this image of this woman whose father was arrested and sentenced to prison because he had stolen a loaf of bread and they found him and the, the king actually sentenced him to life in prison for stealing a loaf of bread because he was hungry. Trying to feed his family, he stole a loaf of bread and they sent him to prison. And every day while he was in prison, they couldn't understand. They said that he would stay there until he starved to death. And they waited on him to starve to death. And he never starved. Because every day, his daughter went to visit him. And she was a lactating mother. And she went and breastfed her own father every day to sustain his life. They wondered why 
he wouldn't die. And then they put a guard on him to watch what was happening and they saw. And the king was so touched and moved that a daughter's love was so great for her father. They said he must be a good man and he released him. Love finds a way. Love finds a way. She couldn't bring in food, but she brought in food. <laughs> Love finds a way. That's persistence. That's persistence. That's persistence. Persistence is not about forcing something to happen for you. It's about flowing and rowing with what God has already put in you. It's not about forcing. Persistence is not saying, oh, you're going to do this. No, no, no. It's not about forcing your way. It's about flowing and rowing with what God has already put in you. And I want you to understand that because sometimes God will send favorable winds and just push you with no effort on your part. That's flowing with God because sometimes the spirit will just move you and open doors that you couldn't open yourself. But it's flowing and rowing because there are going to be some other times that there is no wind. And when there is no wind, you got to row, row, row your boat. It's flowing and rowing. Are you understanding that we are laborers together with him? There is a Godward part and a manward part of every battle. And you got to do your part. And God will send the winds. But when the winds subside, row your boat row your boat is flowing and rowing in the direction of God's purpose for your life flowing and rowing so sometimes the current will flow in your favor and that's like giving you a tailwind when you're in an airplane and, and I, I love it when I'm if I'm flying over to, to, to Europe from America because we have wonderful tailwinds and it means that we get to our destination faster because of the tailwinds but I hate it coming back because you got headwinds and it adds about an hour and a half onto the flight trying to come back this way because you're dealing with headwinds. But when you are submitted to God, God will send favorable winds. But you've got to have your winds while your jet is still blowing. And so it is help that God uses to facilitate you. Does that make sense to you? So for persistence is not about forcing anything. Some people are like, oh, you going to let, you going to do this. No, no, no. It's not about forcing your way. It's about flowing with God's will. You have to be discerning what is the will of the Lord is. Discerning of that will of God and then flowing and rowing with that. But you never give up when you know that you're on the right track. Never give up when you know that you're on the right track. Remember that Thomas Edison didn't invent the light bulb with one try. There were over a thousand failures, but he kept on. Every failure brought him closer to success. I want you to think of that like that. Every failure brought him closer to success. And, and, and I like this, this formula here. Pain plus reflection equals progress. Pain plus reflection equals progress. Many people don't make progress because they have painful experiences and they never reflect. And when they have a painful experience, Instead of reflect, they point fingers and blame somebody else. That doesn't make progress for you though. It never causes you to grow when you're blaming other people for your situation. So if you've got a painful situation, reflect, reflect, reflect. Pain plus reflection equals progress. Reflection turns experience into insight. So whenever I am stopping and reflecting on what has happened in my life, instead of just going, don't just slip and fall and then jump up real quick. Look back to see what caused you to slip. So you can be careful to avoid it the next time. Because if you never figured out what caused you to fall and what caused you to still be thirsty for the same kind of two-legged human being, if you've not figured out What's driving me to people that's not good for me? Why do I keep getting with blood suckers, toxic people that end up abusing me? What, what's wrong, what? Look in that mirror, reflection, reflection. Pain plus reflection equals progress. Pain plus reflection equals 
progress. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Pain plus reflection. And there are too many people that when they experience pain, they shift blame instead of reflecting. And see, when you look at a mirror for a reflection, it's not going to show you your mom and your dad and your enemy and your best friend and all of that. No, no, you, you only see yourself. You get in front of a mirror, you look yourself straight in the eye. That, there it is. You need to reflect and say, what is it that's in me that keeps making me chase stuff to where I wind up with nothing? What's going on with me? What, what am I doing to where I can't hold on to a dime? That every time that I get some money, I can't be at peace until all of it is gone. And then I'm in a mess all over again. You need some deep reflection to say, what's driving me? What's causing me to have this addiction that everything that pops up on my timeline, I got to have it and now you are ordering stuff. And your light is not, your light bill is not paid yet. Your car note and your insurance. But your shoes are awfully sharp. <laughs> That pocketbook and those shoes, that's got it. Boy, your nails, my God. Boy, your lashes, you got all of that going on. Pain plus reflection equals progress. Pain plus reflection equals progress. And if you can't figure out why you keep running out of stuff, you get ready to go to cook something and now you don't have the main ingredients. You get out and you discover, I don't have any of this. Pain plus reflection equals progress. That's why the French have this thing called mise en place. It means everything in its place. Before their chefs get ready to cook, they have everything in its place. Every knife that will be needed to cut and to chop, every spoon that is needed, every vessel, every pot, every pan. You're not gonna get in the middle of that. No, 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 they have everything, mise en place, everything in its place. And that only happens by reflection. So you're gonna, you got to know what I needed last time so that when I do it this time, now I develop a system and I'm not reinventing the wheel. Pain plus progress, plain, pain plus reflection equals progress. And so we're trying to get to the progress. We, we all experience the pain, but very few practice the reflection. And it is unplugging from the digital world that gives us the ability to reflect and to see ourselves, to come aside and by the still waters have our soul restored, to spend the time in reflection to say, how do I become better? I don't want to just keep living the same way. I want to be different next year this time. I don't want to be the same five years down the road as what I am right now. And it's working on something. It's taking the time to reflect and in that time of reflection, there is a switch that has to come on in your brain that changes you from saying, I am helpless and broken to I am growing and healing. And that's the shift that you need to make. That when you're going through a problem, instead of you have to switch in your mindset that I am broken and helpless to I am growing and healing. And that's one of the things, pain is one of your great teachers. Pain is a great teacher. Learning is a gift, even when pain is the teacher. Learning is a gift, even when pain is the teacher. And somehow, the lessons that we learn from pain happen to stick with us. Because you know that when you've touched a hot stove, Mama will never ever again have to tell that baby, hot baby, the baby will come near it and they'll tell mama, ha, ha, hot mama. They know because pain is a marvelous, marvelous teacher. There is a blessing of persistence because if you are persistent, you'll get it. Whatever it is, you're trying to get a degree from school, you're trying to get some type of certificate, you're trying to get qualified in this. If you're persistent, you'll get it because persistence in, enables us to build the habits. 
It takes discipline to have persistence. And persistence develops the habit. And the habit brings us the victory of the, of the change. If you're persistent, you'll get it. If you're consistent, you'll keep it. Some people are great go-getters, and once they get it, then they lay down and just start, you know, goofing off. And that's when we are most vulnerable after your greatest success. You're incredibly vulnerable right after you had a victory. Because you, it, it was your persistence that got it. But now it makes you inconsistent. If you're persistent, you'll get it. If you're consistent, you'll keep it. And if you're grateful, you'll get more of it. If, if I'm persistent, if I'm persistent, if I keep calling back, did you get my application? Did you receive my resume? And, and if I really want to know that I'm persistent about that, did, did you see my text message? Did you get my email? Did you see the missed call? Did I call you five times? Did you see the follow-up letter that I sent after I had visited with you? So that's persistence. Persistence, if you're persistent, you'll get it. People get relationships like that because they were persistent. They kept on calling, they kept on complimenting them, they kept on showing that they cared and that they noticed things about them. And they, they kept, they're persistent. If you're persistent, you'll get it. But if you're consistent, you'll keep it. And if you're grateful, you'll attract more of it. If I'm persistent, I'll be able to get the job. If I'm consistent, I'll keep the job. Because some people put on their, their, their best foot forward the first two weeks. Oh, they were real persistent. They were on time every day. Then after they've been there about three months, they come dragging in late and telling you about traffic. You know what traffic was like that three months ago. It's inconsistency is sneaking in. If you're persistent, you'll get it. If you're consistent, you'll keep it. And if you're grateful, not only will you keep it, you'll be promoted. Because you want to give more to people that are grateful for the little bit that they have. Isn't it amazing that people... I mean, this is what I've learned. That not everybody who's looking for a job is looking for work. <laughs> not everybody who's looking for a job is looking for work. Touch your neighbor and say, I know that person. I know that person. Now, one of you all is that person. <laughs> but you got to... You gotta be persistent. Broken focus, broken focus is the number one cause of unfulfilled dreams. Broken focus, more dreams go unfulfilled because of broken focus. And remember, purpose fuels persistence. So if you lose your focus, you end up not being able to be persistent in what it is you're going after. You got to see that thing and be persistent in it and you cannot stop just because somebody said that the door is closed. The persistent person finds another avenue. They find another way. Check out this little video. I love what we learned. That's persistent. That's dogged determination. That is persistence of where they want it to be to get in that water. You got to be thirsty. You got to be thirsty. You got to be hungry. You got to be hungry because if you won't give up, you won't give up. It'll make you keep on going. That's what Paul writing to the church at Galatia was reminding us about in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 6 through 9. Notice this. Don't be misled. 
You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. You reap what you sow. And those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harbor, harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what's good. Be not weary in well-doing. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. At just the right time. At just the right time, you will reap a harvest of blessing if you don't give up. I say to you today, keep on sowing good seeds. Keep on sowing good seeds. Keep on going, sowing good seeds because you don't let people judge you by the season that you're in. Because that's not where you're going to stay. The season is going to change. If I'm faithful in this season, if I'm persistent in this season, I'm going to go into another season. I'm just telling you. That when you first uh, see uh, Ruth, she is working in somebody else's field. Gleaning, trying to get scraps in somebody else's field. In the next season of her life, she owns that same field. It's amazing, it's amazing. David in one season was out there tending sheep and, and, and they had a very terrible reputation as a shepherd. They were, it was a despised pr profession because you smell like animals all the time out there in the despised thing, but he was faithful as a shepherd boy, dealing with sheep in one season. In the next season, he's the king. Don't let people judge you by the season that you're in right now. You may be broke, busted, and disgusted right now, but your season is gonna change. If you're faithful and grateful in the season where you are, your season will shift. It will shift, it will shift. All that you need is a little time for it to germinate and grow. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 36 says this, patient endurance is what you need now. Patient endurance. Patient endurance. That, that speaks of how you endure something patiently so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. Patient endurance is what you need. Then you will receive all that he has promised. And it's not because we are waiting on the thing, it's because we are trusting in the character of the one who promised, the God who cannot lie. We're trusting in his character. That's why we can believe his promise, because we trust and believe his character. James chapter 1 and verse 12, notice this. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. He blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptations, trials, tribulation because afterwards they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Then I want you to notice Revelation chapter two and verse 10. Don't be afraid about what you're about to suffer. See, don't think because you're saved that you're not gonna go through any suffering. You're gonna go through some suffering. He says, don't be afraid about what you're about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You're going to be on lockdown. You're not going to be able to have the freedom to do everything that you want to do and to buy what you want to buy. That's, that's a form of that being into prison. You will suffer for 10 days. It's a time of perfection of trials. So that when you go through, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a trial testing period. He says, but if you remain faithful, there it is again. If you remain faithful, even when facing death, even if it feels like it's going to kill you. He said, I'll give you the crown of life. He said, that's when you'll start living. If a person is willing to give up their life, that's when you'll receive your life. But if you try to hold on to it, that's when you lose it. He said, if you remain faithful, even when facing death, that's when you'll get it. It's about the right perspective. The right perspective. You know, see, the Bible talks about how God formed man in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. How God formed man out of the dust of the earth. You know what dust is? It's the stuff that collects in your house. It's dirt. But dust by itself is the end of things. When, when things die, they eventually turn to dust. From dust thou art, and to dust you shall return. You've come from dust, and you're going to return to dust. But he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Dust is just dust, but when you mix dust with water, it becomes clay. Dust says that something is already finished. It's the end of it. It has turned into dust. But if you mix it with the water of the Spirit... It's now clay 
which now has endless possibilities. It's not the end of something, it's the beginning of endless possibilities. That if you let the water of the Spirit of God touch your life, He will fill you with so much creativity that there are endless possibilities of what you can be molded into. So it's not the end of something when you mix it with the water of the Spirit of God that brings you into the beginning of endless possibilities. And this is why the Bible talks about in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 3 that he will give us beauty for ashes. The stuff that has burned to the ground, the stuff that you've lost that needs to be recovered. God says, I'm going to make all things beautiful in their time. I'll take that what feels like ashes right now because you lost a spouse, you lost a child, you lost a house, you lost a car, you lost a relationship that was dear to you and it's ashes. But God says, I know what you lost, but I'm going to make it beautiful in its time. He says, give it time, give it time and you watch what I will bring out of the ashes. You're going to be like the phoenix that rises up out of the ashes. I'm going to cause you to be able to soar. I know you lost something. I know it was painful. I know it caused you tears, but they that sow in tears shall reap in in joy, in joy, in joy. So he's, he's saying, let it die. Except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. But if you let it die, it'll bring forth the harvest. And that's what God is saying. Let that old thing die. Let it die. Give it to me. Give it to me, all of your aspiration. Just let it fall and let it die. When I raise it back up, it's like the seed that falls from the farmer's hand. It goes to the dust where it looks like it's finished. From dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return. It looks finished, but when dust goes in and it is mixed with water, what they didn't realize is that God put a seed in the dust. And when water hits it, whatever is buried is coming back up. It wasn't buried, it was planted. And whatever is planted is coming back up. And that's why he's able to give you beauty for ashes because it looked so uncomely as it died as a seed but the beauty of the bloom comes when the plant comes it is life that is born out of death and here's what I want you to realize is that in the midst of all of your pain and your disappointment the things that you experience in this life you can rest assured that if God does not remove you from trials, he will transform you through them. If he doesn't remove you from the trials, he will use the trials to transform you. In other words, the way that God works, if he doesn't remove you from the trial, he'll transform you through it. If he doesn't take you out of the fire, he'll make you fireproof. He'll transform you through it. He will transform you through it. That your troubles will make you who you need to be. They'll give you the strength of character. They'll build empathy in you and compassion for other hurting people. If you had never struggled to be able to feed your family, you wouldn't have compassion on anybody else that's lost and destitute. God will make you better through your struggles. I'm just telling you. That's, your struggles give you your story. And in your struggle, in, it's, it's your story and that's where God's glory is and so just, just realize that either either he'll deliver you from the trial or he'll transform you through it so God's in a transforming thing he's transforming us through your trouble God uses your trouble in your life to transform you there's a strength that is in you that you don't even realize if God had told you ahead of time all of the stuff that you were going to deal with you would have said God I can't handle it I cannot handle it, but for your protection, he hid it from you until it happened and you had to trust him to be able to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You walked through pain, you walked through burying people that you love, you, you walked through caring for sick people. You've had to walk through it. And had they told you that you were going to deal with all of this, you would have said, there's no way in the world that I can do this, God. But God says, if I show it to you little by little. That's why God's greatest protection to you is to hide what he is doing at the time so that you trust him, trust him because it will overwhelm you. If he showed you all of this stuff ahead of time, you would have said, Lord, I resign right now. I cannot do it. I will not go. He lets you go and trust him 
along the journey and he strengthens your legs of faith, your heart, your mind. He strengthens you and crafts you and builds you into a strong person. I've never ever seen a strong person who ever had an easy past. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22 and 23 says that the faithful love the Lord. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercy never ceases. Great is his faithfulness. His mercy begins afresh each morning. I don't know about you, but every morning God's mercy is made known to me. Every morning. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. You know why they become afresh each morning? It's, it's a sunrise. The sunrise that you see in the morning is a divine prophetic message to you that says darkness has an end. It is a prophetic message that no matter how much darkness you go through, the sunrise is a prophetic confirmation to you that darkness is temporary. It might feel awfully dark right now. Some of you are in a dark season, but darkness is temporary. Weeping may endure for the night, but comes in the, in the morning because he sends a new light. He says, arise and shine for my light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. It is God's prophetic. Every sunrise is nature prophesying to you that darkness is temporary. It is temporary that whatever negative period of struggle, it is temporary. The sunrise reminds you of that. Every breath that you take is a reminder that you still have a future. Every time you draw your breath, as long as there is life and breath in your body, it is God's reminder to you that he's not finished with you yet, that he's, you've got a future. You've got a future. And I want you to see what the word of the Lord reminds us about in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 6, he says, always be full of joy in the Lord. He says, I say it again, rejoice. Now I want you to look, go back to verse 4 again. I want you all to see this. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. There's a key there. That if you want to be full of joy, you have to rejoice. Rejoicing is the refilling of joy in you. It, you know, if somebody will say something to you, something will happen, you'll get a tax bill. It'll suck your joy out for a moment. So you have to rejoice. You got to put it back in there. Somebody will break up with you, break your heart, and, and, and it'll snatch your joy for a moment. But I say again, rejoice. It's the restoration of joy. He says, always be full of joy in the Lord. The way to always be full of it, because it will seep out, you have to rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice and then notice he says let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do and remember the Lord is coming soon the Greek says that the Lord is near and he says don't worry about anything I know that that's easier said than done but God says don't worry about anything instead pray about everything and tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Thank him for it. Thank him for it. I like to tell people that before you ask God for anything, thank him for everything. Thank him for everything. Thank him for everything. And I want you to notice in, in, in verse 6 there, when he says, be anxious for nothing, the Greek word is translated in the Greek not as anxious, but as distracted. I think that's very interesting. Be anxious for nothing. Don't be distracted by anything. Keep your focus. Focus on your purpose. Don't be distracted. Be not anxious. Anxiety is just your thoughts going all over the place. Oh my God, oh my God, suppose I, suppose I lose my license. Oh my God, suppose I, I lose my job. Oh my, suppose I, suppose I don't have enough. It's, it's breaking your focus but from the promise that God has given you. It's a distraction. Anxiety is a distraction. And distraction is the destruction 
of your dream in slow motion. <laughs> distraction is the destruction of your dream in slow motion. And that's why our people fail to be able to reach their destinies is because they get distracted along the way. Satan in the garden whispers to the woman, Psst, let me holler at you, Eve. Psst. <laughs> you always get distracted before you get deceived. Always distracted. Keep your focus. Keep your focus. Because here's what anxiety does. Anxiety magnifies our problems and minimizes our focus on God. And that's what it does. It magnifies our problems and it minimizes our focus on God. So it prevents you from being able to see God's power and his sovereignty amid your circumstances. Don't let the distractions mess you up and keep you from your focus. And I would say this to you that Oftentimes when God blesses you, you discover that along with the blessing come some other challenges. Sometimes with the blessing comes a mess. You know, you inherit something, now you got to pay taxes on it. <laughs> I mean, that, there's, there's, a, there's a blessing, but in the blessing comes something else. But Jesus warned us about that in, in Mark chapter 10, verse 29 and 30. Notice, Jesus said, I assure you that anyone who has left house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, or farms because of me and because of the good news, notice he says, will receive 100 times as much now in this life, not in the world to come, in this life, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and farms, notice this, with harassment. The King James Version says with persecution, but it's with harassments. You receive blessings with harassments and in the coming age, eternal life. The principle here is that blessings come with harassment. Blessings come with harassment. You get blessed with a, a house, now you got to clean it. Harassment. You get blessed with a, a newborn baby, but now you got to change the diaper because blessings come with harassment. You get blessed with a car, now you gotta pay insurance. Now you gotta pay, you know, for the oil to be changed. And blessings come with harassment. The little new puppy is so beautiful and you're so excited about it, but the new puppy comes with harassment. They're gonna have an accident on your floor. You're gonna have to get up and take them out when it's raining, harassment. <laughs> Blessings come with harassment. You're never disappointed by what you find in life. You're only disappointed by what you expect it to find. And so Jesus was getting our minds geared to know that when God blesses you, you're going to have haters. And you're going to be harassed. And you're going to receive persecution. Blessings come with persecutions. And that's why you have to ask the question, can you stand to be blessed? Can you stand to be blessed? What's distracting you? What are you anxious over? Whether your health is going to hold up, whether you'll find a mate, whether you'll be able to have children. All of these anxious thoughts, they are distractions. Focus on your purpose. Every time anxiety comes, it's nothing but a distraction to take your eyes off of what your eyes are supposed to be fixed on when you're going after something. When I am running a race, I don't need to be seeing who's eating uh, you know, popcorn up in the stands and who's drinking out of my drink up there. I, I don't, that's, that's none of my business. I'm trying to, my race is right here. I got a finish line that I've got, I got to stay in my lane. I can't be concerned about what's happening in the lane. I, I, I can check them in my peripheral view, but I need to run my race. I need to stay in my lane and give it my all. I don't have time that a fight has broken out in the stand. I'm going to keep on running. Y'all can pull a knife on each other. You can strip naked or whatever. I'm going to keep on running. They're distractions. They're distractions. They're distractions. And every time you get a notification, distraction, distraction. Every time somebody sends you some sexy invitation, it's a distraction. Keep your focus. Keep your focus. Keep your focus. You've got to know when to fight and when to flee. When to fight and when to flee. 
when to fight and when to flee. There's certain things that you fight for. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 14, fight for your families, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters. You fight for things that, that have meaning to you. Fight for your values. Fight for your core principles. Fight for your convictions. Fight for your beliefs. Fight for your faith. There are certain things that you fight from. The other thing that you flee from. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22, it, it talks about, it says flee youthful lust. It doesn't say talk to it and rationalize with it and try to have a discussion, a rational a rap session with it. You, you can't talk about that because if you try to rationalize about raging sexual hormones that are coming in you, you're going to lose the battle. You, 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 you got to get out of Dodge. Because the moment that they start touching you, hormones start getting released and, and then the stop signs get blurry. See, the lines always are blurred before they are crossed. And so you begin to blur them and, and when your emotions are rising up, it's the blurring of the lines. It's a distraction. It's a distraction. It's a distraction. And so what we have from that is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. You'll notice there that we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. They are false arguments. Notice verse 5. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God and we capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. That means that every time that you get a crazy thought, take that thought and submit it at the foot of the cross. That's where the victory over sin was won, at the cross. At the cross, at the cross is where the victory was won. Take the thought and lay it at the, at the cross of Christ. You got a freaky thought and what you, you think that Jesus is, is too holy for you to discuss with him that you experienced a freaky thought? How is he going to help you with it unless you tell him, Jesus, you know what I'm thinking. I'm dealing with this and Jesus, I need your help. I know you died for me. Your blood dripped on that cross and every, there was so much efficacy in the power of your blood at the foot of the cross. Take that thought to the cross, take it to the cross and bring it, make it subject unto Christ. You got to make him your counselor in that moment and talk to Jesus about what has been going on in the inside of your soul. And here's what I would say to you. You have to choose during those times that thoughts start coming into your mind. Choose praise over panic. Choose praise over anxiety, over the distraction. Praise refocuses my attention on God. Worship refocuses my attention on God. Prayer refocuses my attention on God. The Word of God begins to refocus my attention on God. It'll refocus your attention. Energy is finite. Invest it wisely. You can't fight every battle. Choose your battles. Some battles are not worth fighting. Let it go. Don't have, stop having an opinion about everything. Save your energy. You're going to need it. Say, don't be distracted by the craziness that comes out of people's mouths and their comments. You don't have to have a comment about every comment. It's a distraction. It's a distraction. It's a distraction. Be anxious for nothing. Don't be distracted by anything. Keep your focus. Keep your focus. And persist. Nothing inspires me more than the persisting story of President Nelson Mandela of South Africa. He sat in a jail cell for 27 years. And he could have left on his own recognizant by simply retracting some statements. He could have walked a free man many, many years prior. But he sat there out of principle for 27 years. And he never changed. He never changed the values, the, the conviction that sent him there. He never recanted them. He sat there for 27 years. That's persistent. And one day he, he said to his personal detail, I'm not exactly sure what they call them there in South Africa, but they would be synonymous with the Secret Service here in the United States. And he said to these men who were assigned to protect his life, I want to go and have restaurant, to a restaurant and have have a meal downtown and he took them downtown 
and chose, showed them the restaurant that he wanted to go to. And they're all here sitting at the table. And while they're sitting at the table, they all order their food. And while they're waiting, Nelson Mandela looks over and sees a man standing there waiting for his food. And he see, sent the Secret Service over to tell them, tell that man, I want him to join us here at the table and have the meal with us. And the man came over and sat with them. And when everybody's food was delivered, they began to eat. And the man that they had invited to the table, as, as he ate, his, his hands shook terribly. And he went on and finished the meal. And when he did, the Secret Service said to him, President Mandela, he says, that man that you invited to the table was seriously ill. And Nelson Mandela said, no, he wasn't ill. He said, you see, when I was in prison, that was my prison guard. And he said, after they tortured me, each time they tortured me, he said, I would scream for just a little water. And that man, every time, would come and urinate on my head. And he said his hand shook because he expected me to retaliate out of revenge. But he's had, I had to respond to him out of my character and my ethics. And so he says, that's not in me. And he had waited in prison for 27 years, patiently enduring. When you wait patiently, you come out better instead of bitter. But when you wait and don't spend any time reflecting, you get bitter by the moment. And you come out with a narcissistic attitude blaming the whole world for how you feel. And all you want is revenge. But he knew that it would destroy something in his own soul. And he was able after 27 years, going through torture and having a man, every time he asked for water after he had been tortured, to urinate on his head. And then to invite him to a table and treat him with dignity. And never brought it up to say, look at me now. He will make your enemies your footstool. <laughs> if you'll keep your heart right, if you're faithful, be faithful and persist. It was the blessing of persistence because what held him in prison was a principle. He couldn't deny his principles. He could have left had he not been a man of principles and he could have walked free any day but his principles held him there. In the same way Jesus, love kept him on the cross. He could have called a legion of angels that could have come down and rescued him. They could have come with flaming swords and could have destroyed all of the Roman soldiers and everybody that had tried to put him up. It could have caused Caesar to die. It could have caused everybody who had judged him to die. But he said, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was his character. That was his ethic. You don't let the ugliness in other people destroy the beauty that is in you. We are better than that. And when they go low, we go high. Because we have relationship with God our Father. Bow your heads. Before I began this journey with Jesus Christ, since the time I was seven years old and first heard the voice of God, I counted the cost 
And I was determined at seven years old that nothing would ever separate me from God's love. Height nor depth, life, death, negative situations, goodness, blessings. You have to start it from, from the beginning and resolve the question, what's, what can make you quit? What can make you quit? Storms will come. But remember, either God will deliver you from your trials or he will transform you through the trial. And I trust him. I trust him. I trust him. I trust him. Don't let a doctor's death sentence on you cause you to die. Because when they say that you have the C word, God can cause cancer to lay down and die. In the same way of being able to switch it from I'm hurt and I'm broken to I'm healing and I'm growing. Whatever that is malignant in you, any malignant cell in your body that is trying to multiply and form a mass There are three people in this room right now that God is working down into your DNA to reverse malignancy and change your story. I feel the glory of God burning out right now. The curse is reversed. Restoration comes to your body. The generational curse stops because of the bloodline of Jesus over your family. Every suicidal thought every throw in the towel kind of attitude that has made a resolve that I was going to quit but today said the Lord you are arrested for the Lord has rebuked Satan stopped him in his tracks and reversed the curse I heard the Lord say that today is your Ararat. Mount Ararat means the curse is reversed. Renewal is happening. Something is moving in this place right now. If you've been diagnosed with any kind of malignancy and you're not ashamed of it, step, come, 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 come. Come here, come, come here now. Watch what God will do. You watch. Woo! 
Ashkia ye ke manroto magia. Sakaya, sakaya, sakaya boye. Ia pondre gidiata. Step i kabache ki ke obo. Woo, man, man, me also. You're stepping in an atmosphere. You're stepping in an atmosphere right now. You watch what the Lord will do. You watch what the Lord will do. You watch what the Lord will do. He's burning it out of you. He's burning it out of you. Die! 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 Die malignancy! Die malformation! We speak to every cell in your body. Your hindrance is breaking even now. It is breaking even now. It is breaking even now, says the Lord. We cancel the assignment of the enemy. We cancel the assignment of malformation, of deformity, of cells in your body. We call that thing into normalcy in the name of Jesus. 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 I heard it from Nehu say that this sickness, this affliction shall not rise up the second time. It shall not rise up the second time. It shall not rise the second time. In the name of Jesus. In the name, in the name, in the name, the name, the name. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. This thing has hindered you long enough. You got an assignment on your life. You got an assignment on your life. And your purpose is going to be fulfilled. The glory of God is going to be reached in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. He's coming with this divine scaffold. He's cutting it from the root. He's rooting it out of you. It's coming out. Deliverance is yours today. It is nigh unto thee. Even in you, he's cutting it, cursing it from the root. And you will live and not die, declare the works of the Lord. The glory, the glory, the glory. He's distracted you long enough with crazy thoughts going through your mind. Focus on him. Look on looking unto him, the author and the finisher. My God, there is a there is a new sunlight that is arising. And he's saying, Arise and shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. It's a healing light. It's better than laser surgery. This is a divine light. You're stepping right into that light right now. And something is happening on the cellular level in your body in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshua, there's coming brand new fresh testimonies of Jesus, fresh testimonies of Jesus, fresh testimonies of Jesus, that you'll see that this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Others will begin to declare your testimonies and say, this is the Lord's doing, this is the Lord's doing, this is the Lord's doing. We draw a bloodline in the sands of time now that whatever has been running rampant in your family, it stops with you. It stops with you. It stops with you. It stops with you. It stops. Thank you, Jesus. 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 He's in the room, he's in the room, he's in the room. This is your day of confirmation. This is your day of confirmation. This is your day of confirmation in the name of Jesus. Faith comes through your ears, doubt comes through your eyes. But today, 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 we have a funeral for what's trying to kill you. <laughs> and he will fill your mouth with laughter. <laughs> joy, 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 joy. Hey! Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh. 
He's in the room. The Holy Ghost is in the midst right now. He's touching you with his divine hand. Even if somebody's around you laying hands on you, it's the hand of Jesus. His power. His power. The thing that's been tormenting you now is coming under your feet. It's coming under your feet in Jesus' name. It's coming under your feet in the name of Jesus. Under your feet in the name of Jesus. Your triumph over this thing. You shall triumph over this thing. You will live and not die. Ha! Glory! There's some type of healing song that we need to sing right now to seal what God is doing. Darkness, my God. 
it just kept ringing over in my spirit I couldn't let let go Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 17 just kept ringing over in my spirit over and over for I will restore health to you and I will heal you of your wounds declares the Lord hey Woo! glory to God he said because they call you an outcast because they call you an outcast because they call you an outcast Not only will I restore health to you, I'll heal you of the wound, the emotional wound, the mental wound, the psychological trauma that you've been through. He's a way maker. Sing it. Way maker, miracle word. Thank you, Jesus. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, he's the way maker. Step, step right here. Come. All that I know that I heard the Lord say that he has granted the petition of your heart. And that you won't leave the same way that you came in Jesus. There's something that God will do for your glory. I heard him say that your long night is over. Strength, 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 strength. Strength, strength, strength. Strength, strength, Yes, 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 yes.
wish I could lay hands on every person who's down here, but I want you to know that what you need today is not in the man, it's in the atmosphere. The veil has been split. Jesus has stepped out. It's in the atmosphere. It's in the atmosphere. It's in the atmosphere. You reach up with the hands of faith and said, I receive it now by faith. I receive it now. I receive my healing. It is the way of saying, Lord, I thank you for it. I thank you that the seed of healing has already begun in my body even now. Even now. Even now. Even now. Even now. Even now. New life. Restoration. Help. Blessing. Strength. Come to you even now. A rest come over your soul. Even now. He's a way maker. He is still a miracle. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.